in the book of Genesis this morning. We are continuing our series on the names of God. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. I really like this, um, this passage as it foreshadows uh, what Christ will do for us later on. And uh, God decided to send Abraham to the very similar thing that God the Father had to go through. But it's page 21 if you're using your pew Bible, page, page 21. And we're in chapter 22 starting at verse 1 and going through verse 14. It says, some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I, I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the, word for the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together... Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then and the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed, sacrificed it as burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you again for your word. And Lord, right now I pray that it would minister to us and that our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds be open to what you have to say and teach us. And I pray this in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen. So, while I would say most of us would admit to not seeing the full picture of our lives, right? Seeing our, our, our lives, how it's going to play out. Especially, we don't see it the way God would see it. I, I would also say that, that many of us make decisions in our lives like we do see everything. We often make plans and we talk about our plans and as if they were fact, as if they were definitely going to happen, as if tomorrow was guaranteed to us. Also, we often ask God for direction and when he gives us direction, we sometimes have a difficult time following what he has told us to do because we don't see the end result. And a lot of times the directions he give us, gives us doesn't make any sense to us. And we're going to see that happening here with Abraham this morning where God gave him directions, but it really didn't make any sense to him. But following God wholeheartedly requires us to let go what we think are the best choices, what our own minds think, and to let God direct us, to grip onto God's guidance instead. 
Just because God does not always answer in a timely fashion, our time, it does not mean that He does not answer or that He does not provide for us. It just means He wants to make sure that we fully understand what it means to trust and what it means to follow Him wholeheartedly, what it means to rely on Him fully as our provider in all areas of life. So in our series so far, in the names of God, we have learned that God is the creator. That's one of the names. And we also learned that he is the sovereign Lord, that he's in charge of all. And, and last week, we, we learned that God is peace. And as we learn to call him by what he goes by, our knowledge and our awe of the Almighty should also grow. And our faith should also deepen as our knowledge of our amazing God deepens. So this morning, we're going to learn that God truly is the provider, and that is Jehovah Jireh. Now, you kind of know what Camp Jireh means, Camp of the Provider. The Bible gives us many great stories of, of when God provided. In the end, we always see that, that God does provide. In these stories, right, we see from beginning to end, for each of us as the readers, we often wonder why, why do, do, do these characters we read about, why don't they have more trust in God when we're reading through the story? However, we often do the same thing. You see, when we read the Bible stories, we see the beginning and we see the end. So for us, looking out to the end, it's easy to, to, to trust. Yeah, God's going to provide. We know what happens. But when the story is our own, it's a different story. We don't know the end, but yet still God's asking for trust. And it's a bit more difficult to trust in God's provision when we don't see him answering the way we necessarily request it. Well, this morning's story really is no different. And we often read through this story quickly. It's one of the more popular stories, especially in the Old Testament. And we, re we rejoice in the end knowing what happens. And like many of our own life stories, this must have been gut-wrenching for Abraham to get this command from God, to know God has given him this son, this promised son, and now God's saying, now go sacrifice this son. I can't imagine the thoughts going through Abraham's head. I would have questioned my own sanity and if this really was God. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Abraham or haven't heard it in a while, let, let me just do a quick catch up to this point, to chapter 22. So when Abraham, who was at that time named Abram, he was about 75 years old. He was told by God to pack up all that he had and leave. He is told to leave all that he has ever known and to leave and go to a place that God will show him later. This, of course, is a huge demonstration of faith just on Abraham's part, part to, to pack up everything that you have and to head off to an unknown location. So then, then God promised Ab Abram that the entire world would be blessed through his descendants, which, of course, we know is true to this day because of Jesus. But then his wife did not become pregnant. Again, he was 75. That's kind of old to have a child. And his wife wasn't too far behind, and he, they were growing in age, and she wasn't getting pregnant. So he took matters into his own hands, and at the suggestion of his wife, Sarai, he got his, her maidservant pregnant. He did not wait on God. But... God still kept his promise. So when Abraham was about 100 years old, his wife Sarah finally gave birth to Isaac. Now, we don't have anybody here 100, but I think at age 50, I wouldn't want a child, a baby. Hey, I'm 40, and I don't want another <laughs> baby. <laughs> so I can't imagine at 100, people are having great, great grandkids at that point. And here he's having his first. So 
Well, Abraham, he, he seemed to put his, his faith in God many times, and he seemed to have a, a really good relationship with God. God still wants to test Abraham and his faith. And that brings us to our first point this morning. God tests Abraham. Let's look at verse 1 again with me here. It says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. So at the end of chapter 21, Isaac, he's still pretty young. And so some time passes between the end of chapter 21 and the beginning of chapter 22. So because at the beginning of chapter 22, Isaac would be around 15 years old. So that would put Abraham about 115 years old. And the word test here literally means to test completely through a demonstration of stress. Now, how many guys like stress in your life? No. Well, that's how things are tested. If you guys have purchased products, if you have a cell phone in your pocket, even in a car, all those products you have go through things called stress tests. Why? To see how they would react in the real world. And so God actually puts us th through these stress tests as well. And that's the only real way to test our faith with God. And, and this was often used in the Old Testament of God to test the faith and the faithfulness of his people. But this also reminds me of the New Testament passage found in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish his work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Many of us pray and want to be mature Christians in the faith, but many of us don't want to go through the tests and trials that come along with that maturity. We'd rather watch someone else go through that test than have ourselves go through it. So God still uses the same method today to grow us. So trials in our lives, there, there's nothing new. And just as God used in Abraham's life to purify him, so he does the same thing in our lives. Real faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequences. God wants to grow us so that we may become mature, not lacking anything. And by not lacking anything, it isn't, that's not material possessions, not lacking anything that God wants in our life. So here we find Abraham now about to face a trial of a lifetime. So, and, and let's not miss the obvious point here as well. We are never exempt from the challenge of faith, and we are never too old to be used by God. Sometimes the most trying test comes years after following God. Sometimes we think, God, didn't I go through enough already? God's like, no, I still want to grow you. And he does it because he loves us. And that's the only reason why. He's a loving father and he wants us to lack nothing. Now, here when we see God call him, I, I love Abraham's immediate response when God ca calls him. He says, here I am. That's how he responds. It reminds me of, of Samuel when he finally responded to God. And, and this is a response of experience and, and, and of one of, of good relationship. He knows God's voice. And God doesn't call to him multiple times. He immediately says, here I am. And you see how a servant would respond to a master. And this is the seventh time that we know God called to Abraham. But this time, God is going to demand something that is going to test the limits of their relationship. And of Abraham's full trust in God. This is what verse 2 says. It says, take your son, this is God speaking here, it says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now I find it interesting that actually God uses four phrases here to describe Isaac. He calls them your son. He tells them, He's your only son, right? He's, 
he's the son that's going to the promise is going to be brought through because it might make might make any sense how is he the only son because he has ishmael through the maidservant but god say no this is your only son because his son i promised you and then he says whom and he calls him by his real name isaac this name has been given to him and then he says whom you love so god's really describing who this person is and he's almost like reassuring abraham I know how close Isaac is to you, and I'm still giving you this command. And he's also saying, to, almost the same to Abraham, not only do I know as close Isaac is to you, but Isaac seems to be everything in your life. And really, I should be everything in your life as your God. Is, is this son of yours more important than me? Are you going to give him back to me and really trust me? And this, the next sentence must have floored Abraham, right? As God commands him to take Isaac and to go to an unknown mountain, again, to an unknown location other than Moria as, as a region, but he doesn't know the mountain he's on, and to sacrifice him there. God is at men's words saying, go and sacrifice him there. And this was, this was an all-in sacrifice. This was a burnt offering. And if you study offerings at all, this is one of, the, one of the few offerings that they give where you put it on the altar and nothing but ash remains. There is nothing remaining. Not even the wood, not, not a piece is left. And so he's saying, the ice is going to be a burnt offering. Every bit of him is going to be consumed by me. And so this is telling us that, that sacrifices cost us something. In 2 Samuel Chapter 24, verse 24, David reminds us how costly a burnt offering actually is. He says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So this burnt offering is costing Abraham everything. Notice God gives no real explanation to Abraham, just an expectation that Abraham is going to obey him. He doesn't give, okay, these are the three reasons why I want you to sacrifice Isaac. He just says, no, this is what I want you to do. Now go do it. And, and sometimes we are not given reasons either because God just wants us to faithfully follow him, right? Or this is the test, right? This was costly to Abraham. And it was also confusing because Isaac was the crucial foundation stone for the fulfillment of the promise that Abraham will become the father of many nations. That's from Hemphill in the Name of God book. So this, this would not make any sense. Abraham thought, I got the son now that God promised me, that God's going to carry out this promise he gave to me, and now he wants me to sacrifice him? Okay, this doesn't make much sense, but that brings me to our second point. Even with that not making any sense, Abraham obeys quickly. So we have to give it to Abraham here. His first action after getting this incredible gut-wrenching uh, uh, command from God, he didn't argue with God. He didn't even question God. What does he do? He immediately obeyed. Here in verse 3 it says, early the next morning Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him his, two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he sent out for the place God had told him about. Now, growing up, my mom would tell me to do a lot of things. I always had a lot of chores, chores that I really didn't like. And sometimes I would be in the middle of playing, and I'm like, I'll get to it, Mom. And my mom would reply, Andrew, delayed obedience is disobedience. Fine, Mom. I'm disobeying then. But I, I, would, I would phrase it a little bit different with God and say, delayed obedience usually leads to disobedience. Th this is a general rule because usually you end up not doing all that has been commanded, right? Or usually you just don't do it at all. Because when you delay the obedience, your mind starts working and saying, oh, well, maybe I'll just do this much. Nah, that's good enough. Or you know what? I wasn't asked again, so it must have not been that important. And you just don't do it. And so, if you know what God wants you to do, and you put it off, then you're not obeying Him. If God tells you to do something, 
do it. James 4, 17 puts it this way. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. That's pretty simple, plain, laid out, right? So Abraham, though, I think he knew this lesson because I think early in his life he kind of messed up, especially with Ishmael, and he said, all right, this time I'm going to get it right. Even if it makes no sense, I'm going to get up and I'm going to start obeying God immediately. And his immediate actions were he got up early, he saddled his donkey, he took two servants, he got Isaac ready, and he cut the wood for the offering. And this was quite a distance journey he was going to be going on. But, but his, his actions were a result of him wanting to fully obey God and what he wanted him to do, right? There would be no excuse for him when he left and got to, go, got to the place of sacrifice. He had everything he needed to make that sacrifice. He brought with him servants, he brought with him the wood, and he had probably food and shelter on the donkey. God gives us commands. We just don't need to read these commands. We don't just need to listen to these commands on a Sunday morning. We just don't need to hear these commands from God and say, that was very good, and write a book about it. No, we need to put them into action. We need to do what God has commanded us to do, just as Abraham did here. And we need to follow God and what he has called us to do. And just because God commands us to do something, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. As we see with our third point, Abraham persistently obeys. Verses 4 through 6. What we can see from Abraham in verses 4 through 6 is that he is, in his obedience, he is persistent. So on the third day, so they're traveling for third day, for three days here, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As they approached the final destination, I can't even imagine what Abraham was going through here, but through his mind. So he had three days to really think about this command he's carrying out. And when he finally gets there, he tells his servants to stay behind. And with them, he's carrying the two implements that will end his son's life. He's carrying the knife in one hand that would drain the blood from his son and he's carrying the fire in the other hand that will consume his son's body after he's gone. He knows what's going to happen and his son is carrying the wood that would ignite the flame. But there still must have been hope for Abraham that God would somehow provide a different way. Because here we notice by the words that we can see, it says, we will worship and we will come back. In the first, this is the first instance of worship in the Bible. We really can't fully understand what it means with just the word worship used. At its heart, worship involves a willingness to surrender all to God, holding nothing back. It is obediently giving to God what he wants and trusting him to provide whatever we need. Think of that all-consuming definition, right? Obediently giving God what he wants and trusting him to provide what we need. That's worship. Worship isn't singing. Worship isn't just studying God's word, but it's obediently giving to him what he says he wants from us and saying, now I trust that you're going to provide all that I need. So while Abraham does not know how, he, maybe he thinks that God will raise him from the dead. But he is assured, in his language, he is assured that they will both come back to the servants. Hebrews 11, 17, verse 9 gives us some deeper insight of what was going through Abraham's mind here. It says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God has said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be 
reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So while it did not make any sense to sacrifice his son, Abraham was prepared to do so. Abraham knew that God would somehow work it out and to maintain his promise to bless the world through Isaac, even if he had to raise him from the dead. <coughs> and what is stunning here, there's no other early, earlier in, in, the, in, the New, in the Old Testament at least, early recordings of anybody coming back from the dead. So Abraham was kind of believing something that he's probably never witnessed before. That he knew God was all-powerful. Abraham knew that, that nothing was impossible with God, even things he had never seen. But Abraham's obedience persisted through all the unknown. And finally, Abraham declares the provider in verse 7 to 8. So as Abraham and Isaac walked into the mountain together, Isaac spoke up and said, and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Again, Abraham's faith in his God carried his answer. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Notice that Abraham not only answers that a sacrifice will be provided, but he also declared who the provider was, saying, don't worry about it. God will provide the sacrifice. And the word provide is the word gyra, and it has a very rich meaning. It is translated to see and as provision. God sees beforehand what it is that he will provide. That's the amazing and awesome thing about worshiping and serving a sovereign God is that he sees all. He knows all that's going to go down. That's why we need to trust him fully. So Abraham knew that God would somehow see to it that everything would work out. He would be able to worship because God would provide the offering for sacrifice. And fifthly, Abraham trusts God. So Abraham told Isaac who would provide, and he also trusted the provider by fully carrying out God's command. So when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. Now, Abraham had every intention, right? I mean, at this point, even if you got to this point, just to begin to lay out the wood, that's a pretty big step. Then he's binding up his son who was a teenager, I don't know if he fought back, laid that son on the wood, on the altar, which would be scary. Like, all right, Dad, I think you're joking. You could stop now. Then he raises his knife. He's about to slay his son. He showed his complete trust in God here as the provider all the way to taking his knife out and holding it over his son about to kill him. But then we see God provides and our sixth and final point this morning. With the knife about to come down, an angel of the Lord calls out, Abraham, Abraham. Once again, Abraham responds quickly as a good, obedient servant. He says, here I am. Then Abraham must have almost cried in relief when he heard these next words. He says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So here you have Abraham passing the test. What an awesome, rejoicing moment that must have been for both Abraham and Isaac. But Abraham still had to make a sacrifice. And guess what? God provided that sacrifice. Abraham looked up in verse 13. He says, there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And what's pretty awesome here is that burnt offerings had to be a perfect ram, a perfect lamb had to come out. And so the fact that it was caught in the, 
the thicket. It was uninjured. It would have been the perfect sacrifice. And God provided for that. And was right there. Somehow, God directed this animal to be at the right place at the right time. Now, by human standards, we would have said, God, you really cut it close that time. And God's saying, first of all, I'm not bound by time. Second of all, my timing is always perfect. You just need to trust. Up until the end, trust. Abraham passed the test, and as a result, he called the place the Lord will provide. This is the name Jehovah Jireh. At just the right time, God came through for Abraham. He is the provider, and he always supplies at the right time. He always supplies the right thing at the right time, in the right place. He is never late, but he is seldom early, and he certainly never caters to our timetable. All right? God tests us to grow our faith, to keep us focused, to make us fruitful. So this morning I ask all of you, what is your Isaac? What is your Isaac? If we are to live like God is our provider, that he is truly our Jehovah Jireh, we must be willing to surrender all to him. We must be willing to fully obey him. Is there anything you're holding on to today? Maybe a child, maybe a relationship that you're trying to control. Maybe there's a possession in your life that you won't want to let go. Maybe it's your plans for the future. Maybe you, are, you don't want any change to happen in your life or in the community or in the town you live in. You're holding on to that the way things have always been done. It's time to put all those things on the altar and give it to God. I have to give things up to God every day myself. But there is something in particular that I had to give up to be here with you guys today. And that was my dream and my plan for my future that I had laid out. My dream to become a lawyer. I had to put that on the altar and sacrifice that to God. And he provided. But he didn't provide until I fully gave up. Now, I had to wait a year between when I finished my classes at Rutgers University and started my classes in Lancaster Baba College. But in that time, God provided for me a woman in my life who would eventually become my wife, Amanda. In that time, God doubled my father's salary so that the promise God gave me that I would not have to take out a loan to go to Baba College would also be fulfilled, that my dad's was able to pay my full tuition for the three years I was in Bible college. I have not forgotten this, but that wasn't the last test God would give me. And each day, I need to lay things on the altar, possessions, people, and my time. How about you? What is it? What is your Isaac? Who do you have to lay on the altar or what? Now, I'm not implying that all possessions or plans are, are bad and that we need to get rid of them and not plan at all. But what I'm saying is, if we are not careful, then we can end up, like th those plans, those people can end up being our main focus, our main goal, and not the one who has provided them for us. Abraham was willing to praise God and give that which was most important before he saw God's provision because he was determined to worship the blesser, not the blessing. Trust God to provide for your needs today. When you do, you will find who is your Jehovah Jireh. Jesus challenged his followers not to be anxious about what they would eat, about what they would wear, or even where they would live. If you just put him first, all these things will be added to you, as he told us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Hudson Teller was famous for saying, when God's work is done in God's way, it will never lack God's supply. Call out to Jehovah Jireh by name and ask for his provision. But first, make sure you have settled the issue of preeminence, of who is first in your life, who is most significant to you, because that needs to be God. It is only 
as we sacrifice what is most important to us that we will discover that God is most important, that He will provide for us in a profound way. When we go through seasons of testing, remember God sees. When you feel overwhelmed, remember God will provide. And when you are troubled, trust in God, your provider, Jehovah Jireh. Now I'm going to close with a prayer this morning that A.W. Tozer prayed from the pursuit of God. And as I pray it, listen to the words and pray along. I wonder if, how many of us can actually pray this. Let's pray it now. It says, Father, I want to know you, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding, and I do not try to hide for you the terror of parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all these things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self so that you may enter and dwell there without arrival. Oh, sovereign God, we do pray that, Lord. You know we are weak, but in our weakness, you are strong. And I pray, Father God, that each one of us here can truly fully surrender all to you and that we can be gracious with each other as we do so as you are gracious with us and we thank you lord that you are jehovah jireh that you are the provider and let us live that way so that our lives will be a testimony of who you are that we never get that glory but it all point to you and we thank you for using us, Lord, as instruments of ministry here in our communities. And I pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen.